All right, we're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. We are uh, in the middle of boot camp. We're moving towards the end of boot camp, uh, getting ready to graduate. Uh, got two more weeks of boot camp. Uh, can't wait to see what it's like when we graduate. But we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and Paul is speaking here. Now, I don't know, I don't know what you think about the Bible. I, 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 you know, people have different opinions about the Bible. Some people think, you know, oh, it's just a historic book. It's just, you know, some people wrote down, humans wrote this down. I actually had a seminary professor who told me uh, one day in class, told our class, he, said, he held up the Bible and he says, you know, this is not the Word of God. And you can imagine our reaction to that. We were like, what are you talking about? I mean, I had a professor tell me that in seminary. Can you believe that? It, I believe it is the Word of God. I believe it is an inspired Word of God. It is the truth. And, and so I want to live by it, and I believe you do too. Paul writes with incredible uh, giftedness. And, and I often think, you know, Paul, Paul was probably one of the most brilliant people who ever lived. Have you ever thought about that? You, you should follow some of his logic. You know, if, if you're an intellectual, you should, you should dig in sometimes and, and understand how he weaves together the Old Testament and the New Testament. He does some amazing things with Scripture as he's convincing people about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. You've got to understand, this guy, he's the guy who used to be against Christianity, doing everything he could to stop it. And now he's writing with as much passion as anybody could ever write in support of Jesus Christ and Christianity. And so it's not just words that are written on a page. This is the inspired word of God and it's truth and it's the authority for us in our lives. Now, I don't know about you, when you're reading along, do you ever get to some of these lists where they talk about sins and different things and, and you're reading along and you're going, uh, okay, okay, don't do that one. No, God, I'm okay there. I'm okay. I'm okay. And then you hit one and you go, uh-oh. You ever do that? And it's like, darn, I was hoping he wouldn't put that one in there, but it's in there. And so you're like, that's me. Well, listen, you're going to hear some words today. You're going to hear some sins today. There might be some that you've been guilty of at times, but there's a reason he's writing, and he's writing with authority. So follow along with me. It'll be up on the screen. Watch what he does. Here's what he says. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this. Now, hang on to that for a minute. You know what he's doing here? He's pulling the apostolic card. That's what he's doing. He's pulling it out because he's saying, you need to pay special attention to this because this isn't just me speaking. This is the Lord's authority. This is Jesus Christ's authority that, that gives me the right to say what I'm about to say to you. And so it's, it's very, very important. And so he then says this. He says, I say this. He says, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Now, let me explain this to you. Gentiles. You know what he's talking about there? He's not talking about all the Gentiles who are believers. He's talking about those people that were in Ephesus that were not really believers in Christ anymore or had never been a believer in Christ. And they're living in a culture that is horrific in the sense of the morality of those around them. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the things they're doing there just blow your mind. And you think people actually did this and, and this was their way of life. So he's talking, he's talking about the people around these new Christians. He says, you, that's not who you are. He says, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Do you, you follow me? Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far. You might underline those words on your sermon notes. Wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But, hold on to the but. Anytime you see the word but, the emphasis comes on what's next. That isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have, been, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So here comes the list. Get ready. You ready? Here we go. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Here you go. And don't sin 
in letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Not done yet. Here's more of the list. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Like, I don't steal. Are you stealing the time that you should be giving to your family or to God? Stealing doesn't necessarily mean you're taking money or you're take, taking somebody's property. It can be in other ways, too. You're stealing what's God's and what you should be giving to God. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't, here it comes, don't use foul or abusive language. Anybody watch the Georgia game last night? <laughs> you didn't use foul or abusive language there. Let everything, underline that word everything, you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he, the Holy Spirit, has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of the redemption. Here comes some more list. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. That's, that's a lump all category right there. All types of evil behavior. Get rid of it. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And so, 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 so you hear what he's doing. And he pulls out this apostolic card. He says, this is really important. And here's why I think he's pulling out that card in this particular place in the scripture. I think he's doing it because he is concerned that some Christians here, these new Christians that he's speaking to, might go AWOL. That's the title of this sermon this week. AWOL. Some of you guys and girls in the military will understand what AWOL is. Some of us who weren't in the military may not know. But here, here's what AWOL means. It means absent without leave. Or some, some people say away without leave. But absent without leave, I think, is the official um, acronym there. So it's walking off the base. It's failing to show up for your assigned post. I mean, it's also to depart from duty without leave, without permission. To... Absent oneself is another way to say it, without explanation. It's like you just walk away. You, you, you just leave. I mean, we've heard stories of military folks who've done that. Uh, very famous case, uh, you know, in the last few years of someone who walked off of their station. And they had to go find him. He got captured, you remember, by the Afghanistans. So, so it's, it's walking away without really permission or explanation. It's shirking your duties, you might say. So Paul says, don't be like those around you. Don't wander far from the life that God gives. Don't do that. Don't have closed minds or hard hearts because if you do, you won't have any shame. Don't live the way they're living. Don't live like that any longer. Don't go AWOL. So you're thinking, well, that's not going to happen today. I've never gone AWOL. I've never really walked off of my, my job or my duty or, or whatever it may be. Christians today wouldn't go AWOL, right? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Because let, let me give you some stats. I like if you if you're uh, you know somebody who likes statistics. Let me let me give you some statistics about Christianity in the world. Do you know how many people there are in the world? What's the world's population? Anybody know? Hey, it was already up there, wasn't it? That's okay. You're doing great. Go back to it. 7.5 billion. That's that's the that's the world's population by I think the most recent count that I saw as I was studying this. So that's the total population in the world. Do you know how many of those people in the world would claim to be Christians? Anybody have an idea? Check. Yeah, you're close, but not quite. Watch this. Check this out. 2.3 billion. That's billion with a B. And that's basically one third of the world's population claims to be Christian. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but you, you think there's 2.3 billion Christians in the world. Wouldn't you think, Just I'm, I'm just posing this, wouldn't you just think that it might look a little differently if 2.3 billion people were Christians in the world? Maybe? Okay, okay, you say, all right, that's around the world. But let, me, let me bring you to the United States. Watch this. How many people live in the United States, do you think? Check this one out. And boom, it's up there. Hey. Three 329.45 million people in the United States 
as of August 2019. Pretty current. Now, that's, a, you know, reaching 330 million people. Now, how many people in the United States claim to be Christians? Watch this. 230 million people identify, self-identify as Christians in the United States today. That is about 70%, I think 69 point something percent of the population of the United States claims to be a Christian. Now, now let, me just, let me just pose this question. Does the United States currently look like a Christian nation? It doesn't, does it? Could it be, I, I'm just asking maybe what Paul might ask, could it be that some Christians, probably none in here, but there's some Christians somewhere that have gone AWOL? Could that be? Because Paul says, you, you, that's not who you're supposed to be. You don't want to do that. I mean, does America look like a nation that has that many Christians? I think we would say resoundingly, no, it doesn't. Which means some Christians either aren't living up to their responsibility or they're claiming to be a Christian and they're really not. And, and that makes a difference. It makes a difference because you can claim to be a Christian but not live as a Christian. The question is, are we living the life that God has for us? Or are we walking away from it? Now, I, I think it happens. I think it happens. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm your preacher. I'm supposed to be honest with you. Sometimes it happens in our lives. Now, we don't mean to. It's not like we set out this morning and I'm like, okay. I'm going to go AWOL today. Guess what, Jesus? I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to leave you right back here where you are today. I'm going to go do something else today. We, it's not like we set out to do it. We're, we're not intentionally trying to shirk our duty, duties as a Christian. We're not, we're not trying to do that. It's just all of a sudden, kind of like those sheep that are in a fold, and they start eating. I don't know if you know much about sheep, but they just they keep their nose down, and they just eat, 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 eat. And when they look up, the rest of the flock's going somewhere else, and they're out by themselves. And they're exposed to the wolves. And sometimes that happens to us as Christians. We, we don't intend to do it, but we end up there, and we end up blending into the culture around us when we do that. And then here's what happens. I'm carrying it on out. Christianity begins to be shaped by culture instead of culture being shaped by Christianity. That's a problem. And Paul says it was a real problem in Ephesus because what he, he was starting from scratch. He was lighting a fire in Ephesus that was going to change the whole area. And it would eventually. And so he says, this is who you are. This is the fire that's inside of you. Now live into it. Paul says, you didn't, you didn't learn all that old way of living when you learned about Christ. You learned about something brand new, who Christ is and who Christ has you to be. Because Jesus didn't let the culture shape him, right? Some of them wanted him to. Some of them wanted him to be a king that would overthrow the Romans. He wouldn't do it. Instead, he did only what the Father in heaven told him to do. He didn't let culture shape who he was, and neither should we. We're supposed to be set apart. That's what Paul is saying to the Ephesians here, and he's saying the same thing to us. In fact, we're supposed to be Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? Ambassador is the highest ranking non resident official for a foreign government. In other words, uh, I, when we send ambassadors to other countries, we are the highest ranking American official in another country, even though we don't live, we're not a, we're not a resident of that country. And, and so he says, that's who we we're supposed to be. And so Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 20. I like, this is from the message uh, translation or um, uh, the way that Eugene Peterson kind of interprets it. Here's what it says. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. Well, look what it says. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Hang on to the speaking part. I'm going to get to that in a minute. We're supposed to be his ambassadors. Yet, if my figures are right, and they're right, go check me on them. You can always do that. Our country, our world doesn't look like it's a Christian world or country. A lot of Christians have gone AWOL. It's easy to do sometimes. So how do we avoid that? Here's what I'm going to get to today. Here's how we avoid it. Here's the first one. Here's what we got to do. You and me, we got to report for duty every single day. Every day. Sometimes that's hard to do. Can you imagine if you just, you know, you got a great job, and you just one day you say, you know what? Mm, I'm just not going to show up today. Just don't feel like it. Sorry. You remember that commercial that came on a few years ago? I think it was a NyQuil commercial. 
And the guy goes to the door, he opens the door, he leans in, and he says, uh, hey, uh, David, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to have to take tomorrow off. And, uh, and the camera pans around to who he's looking at, and it's his child. It's like, and it's like <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be sick tomorrow, I'm going to have to take the day off. It's like, we don't get to do that, do we? Just because we don't feel like it, we can't just go to our bosses and say, hey, I'm just going to stay away tomorrow because I just don't feel like showing up as an employee here for the day. Um, when, when our son Jim Towson was, uh, I guess he was probably about 10th grade. We'd been in ministry about a year, a little better. And uh, <laughs> he came to, to Debbie and to me one day and, and uh, just kind of bared his soul. He says, you know what? He says, uh, he says this, this being a preacher's kid, this is hard. And we're like, okay, what do you mean by that? He says, you know, having to be good all the time. <laughs> and uh, we're like, yeah, you know, that, that's hard. But you know what? You really ought to be good whether you're a preacher's kid or not. <laughs> that doesn't really matter. He says, but you know, because everybody, here's what he said. Everybody's watching me. And I feel like I have to just be good all the time. And, you know, sometimes I just don't feel like being good. And I thought, well, we'll work on that later. But I got the, I got the idea. I understand what you're saying there. And it's true. It's hard sometimes. And, and so Paul says, I'm saying to you today, just like Paul said to the Ephesians, we got to report for duty every single day. Jesus knew that would be a challenge. You know what he said about that? Look at Luke chapter 9. He says this. He says, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, you're going you're gonna to do the work of the kingdom of God. You're, you're, you're in as a Christian. You're a worker, and you're in there. If, you, if you're going to do this the whole time, number one, you're not going to plow a straight road, are you? You're going to be doing all this, and, and it's not going to work. He says you can't do that. You're not fit for the kingdom of God. We have to report for duty every single day, which means we have to be intentional. Look what Paul said. He said, throw off your old sinful nature and form a way of life. I, I always insert the word before. For throw off. I insert the word you or me. You know, I have to throw it off. I have to do that. I have to choose that. And he says, put on the new nature. So I put the word you before that. You put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now that ought to be an easy thing. Because we, we ought to be able to say, as we sang earlier, thank God I'm redeemed. You know, thank God I'm, I'm not the person I used to be. If you're still the person you used to be, there's some new you coming. And, and you need to let the Holy Spirit renew your mind and your thoughts, your attitudes, he says. There's a new you there. If you're not there yet, maybe this message is for you. If you're not there yet, you've got to let the Holy Spirit get you there. Because most of us in here, if we're, if we're in Christ, if we're, in, if we're a believer, here's what we ought to be able to say. I'm not who I used to be. Thank God I'm not. Paul could say that. We ought to be able to say that. So, so throw off your old nature. Put on your new nature. So here's a little application for you on how to apply this to your life. If you know as a Christian that you're going to be facing a difficult situation, it could be a family uh, situation that you don't want to walk into. It could be something at work. It could be something at school where you've got relationships that you're struggling with. I mean, it can be any kind of situation. If you go into that situation and there's the possibility that you may not carry through it the way a Christian would, then you might want to not get in that situation. Just stay away from it if you can. Don't put yourself in that situation. First Peter, Peter, the one who walked on water, inner circle with Jesus, said this. He says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires, to stay away from it, that wage war against your very souls. You see, these worldly desires, these things that he was talking about that we don't need to be doing, they are waging war against your soul, trying to carry you back to where you used to be. But if you can't avoid those situations, if you can't do that, then you need to have a plan on how you're going to deal with it and have that plan in advance. Here, here's what I would suggest. You, you, you know you're going into that situation. You know it's going to be trouble. And so this is what you do. You ask someone to hold you accountable for it. Maybe you ask somebody to be praying for you as you're going through it. You know, or maybe in advance you practice your response. When I get into this situation, this is what I'm going to do. It's kind of like 
hand signals. I was thinking about this. I, you probably would never do this. I wouldn't either, but I heard somebody might do this. Um, when you go to a family reunion or you go to your in-laws and you've had enough, you have a signal for your spouse. It's like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> this means, this means we're going, we're leaving. You ever been, you, who has that? Come on, all of you do. Come on. <laughs> I was like, you got to have some hand signals. Then I thought about this. Debbie, come in my bag, would you? I thought about this. What if you could just, you know, get a third grader to follow you around and every time you get into one of those situations and you start doing something on one of those lists that, uh, Paul read a minute ago, what if that little third grader brought out one of these and did this? <laughs> Every time, it's like, hey, uh, listen, I want to tell you about this, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, some people need that. <laughs> some people do. We are to report for duty every single day. And here, here's the second one. Do this. <laughs> Report for duty, but then also this, man your post. Man your post. Here's what I mean by that. Stay the course. Hold your position. You know, you, you've got, you have been given a job as a believer. Do it. Do your job. Paul says, live up to it. Don't turn back. Stay with it. Stay the course. Listen to the psalmist. He, he wrote this. I mean, this is, this is throughout the scripture. We're hearing this kind of encouragement. Look what it says in Psalm 119. You, God, prescribe the right way to live. Now you expect us to live it. Isn't that true? Oh, that my steps might be steady. Fill in that blank. Keeping to the course you set. Then I'd never have any regrets of comparing my life with your counsel. Isn't that beautiful? Stay the course. Keep steady. Keep going. You know, your primary post, let me tell you what your primary job is. If you're a Christ follower, if you're a believer, you know what your primary job is? To be a Christian. That's brilliant, isn't it? To be a Christian. Your primary job is not to be a mom. Your primary job is not to be a dad. It's not to be a teacher or a nurse or, an, you know, it's not to be a, a business person or a banker. It's, it's your primary job, whoever you are, is not to be a brother or a sister. It is to be a Christian first. Paul says it's that important to be that person. And here's the thing. This is just me. But I think Paul would say it too with the Lord's authority. People ought to be able to tell. They ought to know. Because you're a witness. You are Christ's ambassador. And so they ought to be able to look at you and say, you know what? There's something about that person. There's something different about them. You, did you notice how they handled that situation? Boy, I wish I could handle it like that. Listen, it looks like they have their life in pretty good shape. How, have you lived in my life lately? I want to be like that. People ought to be able to see that in us. That's what Paul is saying. Put on this new you. Put it on. Wear it so that people can see it. But it's an age-old problem. I love this. I've been reading this book. It's called Maximize Manhood by Edwin Cole. And uh, he's talking about the fact that uh, as a man, for, for it's really written for men, that we are always looking for, every, every man has a promised land out there that we are searching for and wanting to get to. It's where we become the kind of godly man that God would have us to be. And we leave the kind of legacy that God would have us to leave. And so he's talking about the Israelites and their effort to get to the promised land. And, and you remember that they would complain and someone would say, you know, we were better off when we were back over there in Egypt, we had a house, we had food, you know, it was warm, all this stuff. And, and so he has this little quote. I love it. You might want to hang on to it. Look what it says. Talking about the Israelites, their feet were taking them to Canaan, but their hearts kept going back to Egypt. So I love that old life. I loved, I loved my little house over there. You know that little picture I had hanging on the wall there, man? I just can, I can sit right there and drink my whatever they drank in Egypt, and I'd just have a good time. I loved it. And Paul's saying, you, you can't love who you used to be. you got to love who you are now. you got to live that life out. Your feet may be going somewhere, but you need to know where your heart is. So being a Christian, it's not like a feel-good, feel-like-it option. I just, I feel like it, it's a full-time thing, and we have to man our post. So here's some things that we have to choose not to do. Look what he said. In order to avoid AWOL status, here they are. Going to give you that list again. Watch them real quick. Lying, letting anger become sinful, stealing, foul language, abusive language, bitterness, rage, harsh words, slander, all types of evil behavior. 
It was 11. I don't have the ten fingers. Seven of the 11 have to do with the language that we use. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Seven of the 11. So, so you want to know how you go AWOL sometimes? The words you choose to use and the things we say to people that we love. The things that we say to others that are unbecoming of who we're supposed to be in Christ. You know, the slander, the, the gossip, the rage, the bitterness, the hard word, harsh words, even the lying. So I, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Paul says, don't do that. When you do that, you are AWOL. Don't wander into that life. Don't wander far from the life that God has for you. He says, that's not what you learned from Christ. He says, let the Spirit renew you. Let the Holy Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. That's what we're supposed to do. Put on your new nature, he says. He says, you're Christians now. That's who you are. That's who you're supposed to be. And you got help doing it. Here's the thing. Sometimes it's hard. And you're like, I, I hear what you're saying, Jimmy. I want to be all those things that you're saying. And, and I really do want to find that promised land for me in my life with my family and all that I'm doing. I, I want to find that fulfillment that you talk about sometimes and I hear about. I, I want to get there. Well, listen, you've got help. If you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit is your help. And look what he says about that. Paul doesn't leave that out because he knows how important it is. He says this, the Holy Spirit has identified me as his. Watch what he says. Fill in that blank. Here's what he says in verse 30. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. In other words, did you know this? The Holy Spirit is a person. I mean, just, just as Christ was both human and divine, the Holy Spirit it is not just some, some gas somewhere up in space. I mean, it, it, it's referred to often in the scripture as a person. And so, we, so it means it has feelings. The Holy Spirit does. And so we can grieve him, the scripture says. We can make him feel sorry and sorrow. It says, don't do that. Don't grieve him. Remember, he has identified you as his own. Watch this. Guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So live like it. I am redeemed. I've been redeemed. Thank God I'm not who I used to be. Live like it, Paul says. And, and don't go back. Report for duty every single day. Man your post every single day. That's what we're supposed to do. I'm so grateful that Paul speaks with the Lord's authority here because I need to hear that. And maybe you do too. Well, here's some next steps for you this week to try. Here's that first one. I will ask the Holy Spirit to renew my thoughts and attitudes this week. That's what I'm going to do. I will stop doing the things I know I should not do. Listen, if any of those things on the list caught your attention, there's a reason they caught your attention. I didn't write them. I didn't put them there. God, through the Holy Spirit, is saying to you, stop doing those things. In fact, he gives you the, he gives you the alternative. Do the opposite. Do the opposite of them. And he lays those things out for us too. Look at the next one. I will not give in to the pressure of culture, but stand my post as a Christ follower. And then the last one could be the most important one. I will stop using language that does not honor Christ. You know, uh, sometimes the, what we read in the Bible is tough. It's hard. And uh, we, uh, we struggle with it sometimes because those lists catch us. But in the beauty of it that Christ gives us another chance. So even when we go AWOL for a moment, we can come back. And he says, I'm so glad you're back being the person you need to be. I'd invite our ushers to come forward if they, were, they would as we pray, um, prepare to give our gifts and offerings and thank God that we are redeemed. Father, thank you so much that you have redeemed us. You took us from a way of life that sometimes has a heart even still. But you knew that there was a better place for us. And so you're moving us towards our own promised land through you and in you. So thank you for that. Help us to report for duty every day, to man our post every single day, and to live in such a way that others will see it and know that we are yours and we belong to you. So help us to do that, would you, Lord? And we'll be grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.